Um, when you look at autonomous surface vehicles, let's go back up to the surface now. These guys range from anything from, you know, on the right-hand side, the homemade pontoon or the um, ocean science boat that's up on the upper right that we worked with at University of Southern California, all the way over to BAE, BAE Systems, um, you know, really fast-moving um, military boat on the left-hand side. Uh, the nice thing about the surface vehicles with constant access to GPS, you can do very good path planning. Since you're above the surface, you can use cameras, you can use um, all kinds of stuff for visual navigation, feature detection, obstacle avoidance, following all the coal regs, everything like that. Um, but really the design is kind of up to you. They've got some wind and solar platforms as shown down there uh, at the bottom. Um, and really it's kind of any kind of boat that you could have. They also have sailing boats and things like that um, that are <clears throat> out there as well. So you can kind of imagine what's, what's going on with the surface industry. It's really akin right now to the terrestrial robotics industry. Um, everything's kind of ported right over. Um, a little bit difference in dynamics, but basically everything, all the algorithms work. Um, one uh, special platform I'll talk about um, is the wave glider platform. This is a platform that uh, works on wave energy. So as you can see on the upper left image there, there's a float that's about seven meters below the water, uh, or a glider that's seven meters below the water and a float up on the surface. When an instant wave comes in, the float gets pushed up, fins on the gliding portion uh, move and propel the glider forward, which then it drags the float forward. As it goes down into the trough, the fins go the other way, the float goes forward again, pulling the uh, float forward. Um, these have basically unlimited endurance, are used by the oil and gas industry quite, quite prolifically, um, and we've actually sent four of them across the Pacific Ocean, um, two to Tokyo and two to Australia, uh, when I was down there. And so <clears throat> it took about two years to cross the Pacific, um, or eight, 19 months or something like that. Um, but you can see the demonstrated endurance is multiple years at sea, uh, a very reliable, robust platform. And actually NOAA is looking at these guys for um, to replace a lot of their buoys because they do very good station keeping um, and are very persistent in, in the environment, a very unique platform. It's a company out of um, Silicon Valley called Liquid Robotics that developed these guys. Um, just as a little side note, I, I did actually have one of these out uh, in Monterey Bay for a couple of years, and uh, I set it up so that you could go onto my website and you could control this guy or drive it around um, as you wanted. We put up some, uh, some fake sensor data, and you could go and try to um, traverse an optimal path to try to gather the uh, the optimal sensor data to determine what was going on out there. Um, so we were looking at how people controlled robots, how people perceived the environment uh, to help us de develop some better control schemes. Uh, but this is the kind of thing you can do with persistent robotics is open it up to letting a lot of people do this and gaining knowledge about how control is done. Um, this should play. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to showcase a little bit of work here. Um, will this work? It doesn't look like the videos are working. Uh, Sorry, Ryan, it's not on the PowerPoint that I downloaded it either. There's, there's no video embedded. No videos embedded. All right, so let's do this. Let me just see if I can pull these guys up then. Um, um, let's see, it would be this one. my screen. Okay. Um, Otherwise, if you want to line them up when I'm giving the talk and we go back to you then. 
Um, can you see? Here the, you are. Yep. Can I, you see that? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So let me just. I'll just do it this way. Can you see that? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. So let me give you a little a uh, little video here of kind of some stuff that I've done with vehicles over the years. Um, basically, this is a shot of um, an algal bloom that we uh, kind of proxy put out into the ocean. I'll play this a couple of times. And we had a couple of gliders, autonomous gliders, out in the ocean that were actually tracking this. So what we've done is, um, given the centroid and given the boundary of a dynamic feature, uh, we use ocean model predictions to predict where that goes to feed into the planning system for the underwater vehicle. Um, so as I said here, um, basically we detect a proxy feature, we project this through the environment, and the vehicles are able to, the red vehicle track the boundary, and the yellow vehicle track the centroid of that feature. Um, we do this over a number of days, so overnight uh, we're, we're able to update the ocean model with local predictions and local data were uh, collected, and then reproject where that feature is and then go actually chase and uh, collect data within that feature of interest. Um, another one here, let me show this guy. Um, this is another one. I, we started looking at um, ocean frontal structures, which are dynamic, um, dynamic features within the ocean that are basically the, um, the source of source of life, they support plankton to whales um, in that, the whole food chain all the way through. And so we're looking at how can a vehicle dynamically adapt to a, um, a changing feature. And what we have here is um, the green dot there is, represents the, uh, the underwater vehicle. The red dots are an initial plan. And as we're moving along, based upon sensor data that we're going to find, uh, we're going to collect we're going to mark where we think this dynamic feature is. Um, so I know it's basically kind of somewhere between these red dots. And um, this is a static survey, but just trying to understand how can we autonomously detect where a dynamic feature may be. And as this vehicle kind of traverses through the environment, it's marking where it could be. Um, and then what you'll see here is at the end of a predetermined trajectory, which will be this last dot, uh, this last red dot, it actually abandons the last red dot and decides that that's probably not a good waypoint to go to and started to actually go find this dynamic feature further down the way. Uh, we actually had a boat that was coming in, so I had to grab it and manually bring it back home, which is why you see that, uh, that quick turn there. Um, so then we actually took that out and um, did this out in Monterey Bay as well. And you can see we mapped a whole area here, the red showing where a, a frontal structure may be. The dotted line, or this red line here, gives us an a priori prediction of where that frontal structure is. And then we executed on board the vehicle a, um, <clears throat> a deliberation and planning technique that allowed us to actually track this feature. And you see where the, uh, the black line is delineating, delineating where that feature has moved to uh, over time. And so we're able to, I'll play that again, um, we're able to actually uh, just give it a heuristic idea of where we think that feature might be, give it a path that we think covers that feature very well, and then in situ the vehicle is adapting and you see the blue line there predicting where it should go in order to detect this dynamic feature uh, as it's moving through the ocean. I'll let that finish there. <clears throat> and you can see that the feature it detected was uh, a little bit different than actually the, um, <clears throat> uh, the feature that we had initially delineated, and that was on purpose because it actually was moving. Oh boy. So let me zip through these guys because it started over. Um, and then just to, to kind of close up a little bit, um, I'll hit on a couple of the things that some colleagues are doing. We've actually started running these underwater vehicles under ice as if it wasn't dangerous enough just to run them in the ocean with the fear of losing them. We decided to put them under ice. 
And essentially what they're doing now is they're flipping all of the sonar, the multi-beam sonars, the Doppler velocity loggers and things upside down and pointing them up at the ice to do terrain-based navigation and localization uh, from the height from the ceiling, actually instead of um, based upon the sea floor because sometimes the sea floor is too far away. Um, and they've done some really interesting stuff um, in navigating under ice environments and uh, pretty dangerous little spot you can see up there in the upper right how they actually deploy and recover these things in these big flows. Um, you know, one thing that I'm really interested in is um, spatial temporally dynamic environments. And, you know, just a, a little hint on this is if you look at the autonomous car, um, you know, up in the upper left, that's some of the imagery, some of the data that are being collected by autonomous car. I'd like to take that same stuff and put it underwater. And I always tease my friends at Google and Toyota and things that, um, and Oxbotica that, you know, the autonomous car is actually really easy because nothing moves. If you want to go to the grocery store, you know where the grocery store is. You can just drive there. Um, in my context, the grocery store moves around all the time. And so um, underwater, all these dynamic features, they, they keep moving. Um, so if I have to go to the grocery store, I'm going to a different place every time. And <clears throat> basically, uh, I coined this also is the international traveler's problem. So if you look on the right there and you see Hong Kong, um, it doesn't matter if you can read the language or not. For those of us that have traveled um, around, we can always find a bathroom and we can always find coffee. Those are the two most important things when I travel anyway. Um, and even though the, the signs are in a different language, there's some structure that does exist. And so what I'm looking at right now is how to exploit structure in an underwater environment to do navigation localization in a GPS-denied environment where the environment that you're in also changes and moves. So if you look down here at the lower left, you can see basically what you would see is a representation of an aquatic environment, uh, red being hot spots of interest, blue being cold spots, but you can definitely see a landmark-based structure in this environment that could be used to navigate and localize. And that's some of the work I'm, I'm currently doing right now. And really what this is based on is kind of these Markov random lattices, which are down here in the lower right. And you have basically a current map and a prediction, and then you look at the entropy involved in that, and you can pull out these very interesting landmarks or interesting places to sample. I won't go into many technical details there. If you want to follow up with me, I'm happy to talk at more depth, but that's a whole hour-long talk just in itself. Um, so just to conclude here, where are we? Um, with aquatic robots today, um, we have complex planning and deliberation, most of which we can do on board. Um, we've demonstrated persistence of months to years. Um, specific platforms have longer endurance than others, but we have a demonstrated persistence in the environment. We've done a lot of adaptation, um, you know, during missions, underwater, um, and trying to follow dynamic features just based on sensor measurements uh, on board. Uh, we've basically come down to developing agile and robust platforms. Uh, you don't see a lot of robotic development anymore. The robots pretty much exist as they are. Um, but we've got them very robust, very agile, and very useful uh, in the environment. What we've really gained a lot of traction with and uh, gotten a lot of bang for our buck is with deep learning. That has improved things significantly in our ability to take a lot of data, crunch that down on board, and be able to make decisions based upon nonlinear relationships in a high dimensional space. And this is augmented by, you know, GPUs and, you know, very, um, you know, cost-effective sensing modalities and really cost-effective and energy-effective processing units. Um, and that's what I had for today. I'll uh, leave it there. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field any of those. I know that was kind of quick and a lot of information, but uh, let me know what you think.